We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is John Lee, Chairman and CEO of Silver Elephant Mining. Thanks for joining me today, John. Yeah, Tom, great to be on the show for the first time. Thanks for making the time for us. So I wanted to maybe start by going over a little bit about how you made the transition from Silicon Valley into the silver industry. Yeah, Tom, um, I started my career in the Silicon Valley in 1995 as a software programmer and the software sales. And in two year 2000, I moved up to Vancouver. My girlfriend was from Vancouver at the time. Um, it was semi-retired. Very, very lucky. The company I worked for was bought by Oracle. And uh, a 26-year-old with uh, you know, a bit of option cash style. And you cannot be in Vancouver and get involved in the mining industry, especially in the junior mining industry. And coincidentally, that was when the Bank of England dumped the last batch of gold at $250 an ounce. So I started uh, dabbling in the junior mining sector as a retail investor, and that's how I got started. So in doing some research for today, you were saying that your portfolio got wiped out back in about 2008, but you made it back quite quickly. So can you tell us more about that story, maybe what you learned and how you were able to make that money back? Yes. Well, Tom, you know, we've been through uh, the thick and thin, and I was running my own portfolio while in this eight-digit doing you know, $20, $30 million and doing really very well, dabbling on these juniors with the league tables of the ounces and resources and pounds and stages and geopolitics. And then the world came crashing down for the mortgage crisis. And recall, Tom, Tecumseh was trading like a $2.50. And you had the Quadras were trading like $3, $4. And they came from $40, $50 a share. So I have a bit of a trading background. I started trading stocks in the dot-com era. So it's very analogous to the junior mining sectors. You have the behemoth at the Ebays and Amazons, and you have the commerce ones, and you have the Siebel systems, and sort of, and you were counting the number of, P, the valuation were going out of hand. And in 1999, their valuation were based on the number of PhDs, right? <laughs> and uh, here is based on the number of ounces. You know, there's a lot of analogy. I was able to make it back a lot of it is to, and I learned from, I just learned from trading is, I think it's a combination of fundamentals and, and technical trends. And to be honest, nobody has asked me that questions. So there's a lot of things that I rely on. I look for fundamentals and I was quite blessed because I was doing a lot of trading for the 10 years prior. So we look for assets that have, well, companies that had liquidity that were, were able to pin down the reason for their downdraft. That'll be obviously be great and not something to do with the asset, but rather just to do with the Margin calls or the underlying metal were were going out of it, were were low prices, and then we're doing a bit of range bound technical trading and cashing out and starting from the major producers mid tier and then from the mid tier graduate to junior sectors. So I will attribute Tom to the success as to being quite nimble and not being particularly tied to one story per se and not getting too close to the management because as you know they're biased. And then just, I would say, I think in essence, follow the money, follow the flow of the money. And the money, the flow usually will come to the higher liquidity issuers first, and then from the juniors to the mid-tier, from the mid to the junior, from the junior to the micro caps. And the other thing is, is also looking at sector, you had gold that were coming out earlier than the others, and then the copper and the coal, and then the other things that catch up, the uranium and whatnot. So so there's a little bit of macro play, metal specific allocation, capital allocation to these sectors. And then from there, you're looking at from the top down. So there's a lot of trading, made it back from like around 2011. And but still at the time, Tom, there was still a number of 20, 30 positions that were still trading at penny level. And, and that's why the idea of starting a company and rolling up these assets come about in 2011. So as you're talking about looking at things and, and really relying on fundamentals, that makes me wonder if that's part of the reason that you got so interested in silver, John. Right. Um, I've always been an economist at heart. So I graduated from Rice University in Houston with two degrees, one in engineering and one in economics. And I was through the economics degree in one year and because that's my passion, engineering, because my parents wanted me to do. And because I've also traveled over 40 countries, I stayed in Asia for 15 years, North America for another 15 and other parts of South America for several years and over 35 countries and always have a sort of 
passion for travel as well. So for example, a Big Mac, right? Uh, the Big Mac index, for example. So you always wonder, you know, what makes the world tick? What really drew my attention at that time, Tom, was I remember very strongly, Tom, in year 2000, when things were getting out of hand. And if you were a student of, say, Warren Buffett or Graham Benjamin's value investing, you measure the market by press to earning ratio. And at that time, I remember quite clearly that S&P's PE was something around 20 back in year 2000. So I think there was a lot of study that goes into understanding why the market was so overvalued as what they were, what caused it. That was unprecedented run by the NASDAQ in the year 2000. So that, that was somehow then led to the uh, study of the dollar being overvalued. So I always knew that the dollar was overvalued, uh, also because of the globalization and the status as a reserve currency in the year 2000. But I never really sort of pinned down to gold because who in the right mind is a dot com whiz kid would be interested in gold. But it's only after you go to Vancouver and got into mining and, and you thought it was kind of interesting. And then I started doing study in the history of money. How was it the Fed is created and how gold and silver were money and, and et cetera, et cetera, going back in time. And then I follow a lot of the work from Mr. James Turk and that really sort of very luminous. And then coupled with uh, just, you know, getting getting more so knowledgeable on trading and see the secular trend of the bear market for gold and silver and how the Dow and the, the, the Dow to gold ratio was was at historic low and precedent. So you saw that shift from sort of paper assets, not only in equity, but in bonds and moving towards uh, card assets. So we see that shift. So it's not so much the rise of China per se, but but we just see that sector rotation. So I think that really opened my eye. And because I was very lucky, I didn't have a job, right? So that really got me sort of just like you were doing the last 12 months. I think a lot of guys opened themselves up in all different topics because they have nothing better because they're stuck at homes. So that really, the light bulb went on when I read James Turk and understood really what the monetary system is about and what money is. And that dollar is an IOU and the bond is an IOU on the dollar, which in itself is an IOU. So all it's all derivatives. And then you read Aristotle about the, you know, the meritocracy of why gold is money and what makes money money. So all of that come together made me interested in gold at first. But you cannot be a young guy with a bit of a gam, you know, with a bit of spec mentality and not getting to silver. So I started getting to silver and reading James Turk and Ted Butler. And so oh my God, you get all this commercial, the shorting the market. And that in the end, you know, silver is men's gold and foreign James Turk's analogy, gold is a ship and silver is a rocket, right? Something like that. So if you're interested in gold, you have to be interested in silver. So that's my study and my passion for silver and gold came about really is from a transition from the dot com to understanding the economies, the monetary system to dabbling into the junior sector and then becoming a full time gold and silver investor from early 2000. So in a way, John, do you see yourself as almost having to re-educate yourself on economics after earning your degree to maybe looking at it from more of a, um, an Austrian economics side? Yeah, Tom, it's like, uh, you know, I stayed in Mongolia for several years and I remember this guy who's very famous who said he went to the Russian school, the Moscow and the central planning. And all of a sudden, when he became an entrepreneur in real estate and mining, his whole perception was turned upside down. I got that sort of epiphany as well back in around 2000. You know, you're talking about this earnings, you value company from the bottom up, but I don't think it actually works that way. I mean, there's a very strong correlation between the money supply and the return of S&P, performance of S&P. So it's really, well, not to be judging by the way they run, but, you know, it's not so much top down, but it's really the money trickle down, right? So the first recipient gets the the majority lion's share of the benefit. And eventually when it gets down to commodity level, helicopter level, then that's when the inflation rears its head. And usually that epiphany and, and transition, Tom, I wouldn't say it's a long promulgation for myself to study and to come to the conclusion. It's like, I mean, once you sort of peel the layers, you can come to that realization very, very quickly. And the question is whether you want to take the red pill or the blue pill. And uh, once you do, it's like the matrix you go down the rabbit hole, you know, very, very quickly and everything just unravels. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to some uh, important silver levels that you're looking forward to and how you measure these moves in mochas and vanillas. <laughs> well, one of the great books that I read was uh, Tom Bacon. It's the turf professional betting. And that was written in the 1950s. And also uh, Red Mena sounds like stock operator. And then followed by, say, uh, Nassim Taleb's Black Swans and whatnot. 
So everything you're dealing with the probability. And that's why Warren Buffett made a huge amount of money because they play on people's fear and they were able to sort of extract the probability. So everything is probability. Another example is if you look at the movie uh, Adjustment Bureau, nobody really knows what the next step is. I mean, for example, Tom, real quick, you know, last one in silver when it's 50, it could have go to 100. Nobody really knew. <laughs> Somebody make a call, it's a $20 billion industry, and somebody make a call, it could have a billion millionaire make a call, it could go to $100. So when I made an analogy on, I appreciate you watching the Arcane Economics of three chocolates, three vo- vanillas versus one mocha, mm-hmm. is that earlier this year, I see silver trends as between 24 and a half to 27 and a half. The bullish backdrop to silver is not as strong as it was back in July when all the stars were aligned. So I, w- I didn't really have a call in Q1. I said it's going to meander around 24 and a half to 27 and a half. And then uh, when the silver went down to about 24 for a day, only a week, two weeks ago, I say, now is the time. I was on Yankee stacking. I said, now is the time to buy, now is the time to sell. You want to be buying at the bottom of the consolidation trend. And then I went on to Arcadia when silver is 20, around 26. I say, well, obviously it's not as attractive when it was 24, but still... Silver tend to is a momentous trade. It follows Newton's law. It has very high correlation from performance from the day prior. And so I said that it looks like gold is already shown its hand in that gold is taken out its 50 day moving average, which was around 1650. And so it was trading at 1680. So it was very clear that it was 1750, it was trading at 1780, that gold is broken out as 50 day moving average and silver was just lurking beneath that. So I thought the chance of silver taking out that 50-day moving average, which is 26.30 at the time, it's very, very high. So I recommended people to say, hey, now is really the time to get in. And that's why my analogy. However, the reason you might draw a mocha, which means silver might still trade sideways or even down, is everything hinges on the dollar. So the dollar was just broken down of its 50-day move. So I do a lot of technical trade observation. So I think really the catch is the dollar, if you look at it from January to today, it is an uptrend. Okay, so there's not a really very clear, decisive breakdown yet for the dollar, and it looks like it is breaking down. But if the dollar were to resume this uptrend, then that would spell a bit of issue for for silver, and that's why I also use the analogy that silver has as a bow with a lot of firepower, but the dollar is preventing that headwind. So I mean, things that I talk, I think dollar went down another half a percent, and that's why silver went up three percent on a Wednesday. I also talked about Tom that. Seems to me that cartel smashing is shifted from a Friday to a Monday and Tuesday. And uh, so I had a lot to talk about, Tom, again, I think to answer your question about the vanillas mochas is the probability of favor silver's retest to a big time, res- big resistance is 27 and a half because the bearishness of the dollar and the bullishness of the gold from a technical perspective. Of course, in the long term, we all know dollars phase and gold phase, but for people looking for short term directions, technical analysis does offer a bit of insight. I'd like to dig in, John, a little bit more about explaining the behavior, basically the momentum behind, let's say, silver and gold and, and how it's a gift and good. Can you tell us more about that, please? Yeah, if you look at momentum trade, I talk briefly about it. If you look at how gold and silver, a lot of people, Tom, attribute two reasons, right? The newsletter writers and the financial writers and whatnot, newspaper writers. They say, well, silver went up because this, or well, went down because that. The way I look at it is for silver specifically, because that's what the topic we're, what we're interested in, mm-hmm. it's always the industrial demand that set the bottom. And it's always the speculative demand that sets the blow off the top. And the reason is this, the industry people are price takers. They're not price setters. Every time when price spikes, they look for alternatives, they would defer their, their procurement. They will find ways to reduce their spent or even look for substitute and, and look for ways to cut costs. So as the price go down, the demand go as the price go, the demand go down for industrial users. However, for, for investors, <laughs> we're the ones where you buy the price go high, you buy more. You, if price go higher, you buy more. That's why you see that prices tend to trend from the day prior. And the other thing, very interesting thing about silver, a lot of people don't really pay too much attention to it. But if you look at the charts carefully and study closely, Tom, silver went up. Majority of the silver performance, uh, silver's gain since last July, I think you can attribute all of the double from 14 to right now 28 or even 30 to maybe 30 trading days of gain out of the nine months. So silver went from 14 to 30 in two weeks in July. Silver went from Reddit from 24 to 30 in less than a week. 
And uh, silver went from 24, 23 and a half to what we had 26 and a half in less than 10 days. And a lot of that is because, as you know, Tom, people that believe in silver, it's a transition. It's a red pill. It's, great. it's not like today I'm going to have an orange strawberry shake, right? Once you're in silver, you're not going to keep a lot of dollars. There are very few like Kevin um, or Larry going to keep 5% band every quarter. If you go over, I'm going to sell a little bit. Always keep that gold and silver. Very few people that I know actually do that. And I'm not sure even if they're doing that, even though they're saying that. So if I, then what you have is a lot of people that go in all in. Oh my God, discover silver. Oh, silver is the bottom. They're going to mortgage. So they go all in. And all of a sudden, they run out of steam. And all of a sudden, the commercial come and then they smash the market. So I, those are my thinkings on why. But the facts that they are, they, these are empirical evidence are indisputable. But why they're just offering you some of the possibility for this reasoning, industrial versus speculative the blue pill versus red pill is, is a very linear. It's one and zeros. And that, uh, man, the, the, so it's, it's an interesting market. And that's why there's something I said before many times. These observations doesn't just attach to a short-term price trend, but even on a longer term for commodity in general, you have a 10-year period. You have maybe only one to two years of the going up, right? And then the other years are going sideways and a couple of years going down. And coincidentally, most of the silver gains and for commodities is right after that washout, fake breakdown. And that will create the upside for uh, the commodity folks. And the reason for company go up is, again, is I think largely due to inflation and just the realization of monetary quantitative easing per se, and that there is the permanent adjustment into commodity prices. So, John, are there any parallels to the last big bull run in, in 2011 that we can look at to give us some perspective for the cyclicality of the silver and even the gold market? Oh, certainly. And I think 2011 is one of the closest analogy. And that's why why we really got to study the market. In 2011, it's a mortgage. It's a mortgage uh, crisis. And it was a localized to the US. Even I mean, it was a pretty big deal. It was the world's largest economy. Uh, mortgage agency market was one of the largest debt market outside of the US Treasury. So you're looking at a trillion dollar plus contagion effect. But COVID is magnitudes times more. So there's a lot of analogy to that. I mean, we can spend half an hour talking about, it, but in essence, if you look at some of the major markets like the dollar, the bonds, the metals, and the equity, they exhibit very similar behavior, namely on the peak of the crisis, which was January 2009 versus March 2020. You see the peak of the dollar and you see the bottom for gold, you see bottom for equity, and you see the peak for bonds. And then after that crisis came, you, you have the very quick precipitous event where the dollar crash, right? The gold surge, equity surge, bond, uh, bond started crashing because the safe haven plays are gone. It's, we're almost playing out exactly as was 2011. I would point out a couple of differences. One is the pace, the stimulus. Well, the first difference is the magnitude is a whole lot bigger, multiple times bigger in QEs and all these measures. I mean, fast balance, you went from two trillion to seven trillion less than nine months is completely unprecedented. But magnitudes aside, the time it takes for the story book to play out is much accelerated. So what I mean by that, for example, it's taken over a year for the equity market to recover to the prior crisis high, but we're not even a year. We're six months after the peak where the equity already breaking an all-time high. And uh, same with the dollar. The dollar went down quickly with what happened. But in 2010, a four year after the financial crisis, dollar staged a rebound that lasted about almost seven months. But in our scenario, the dollar started rebounding in January when it's 88, 89, but now it's around 93. It looks like it's petering out. And we're not even three months into the whole cycle. So it seems to me that um, there's not a lot of knowledge to pay out. The differences are the magnitude is a lot bigger. The stimulus are coming a lot quicker. And the dollar is weaker than last time. The dollar almost recovered to its crisis peak in the last round. But this round, the crisis peak is 110. Now we're at 93. We're 10% below that. But the difference, very interesting, and I'm glad you bring this out, I think for a bit more sophisticated view audience, you'll notice that in gold and silver, they really never traded below their strong technical support in the last go around. So last go around, gold and silver and oil, everything went up just like this time round. But gold and silver last round never went below technical moving averages of 200 day moving average. But gold this time is very weak. So that really got me to thinking why, especially given the weak fundamentals of the gold market. And 
the couple of reasons I can come up with is number one is the advent of the cryptocurrencies. That really, really sucked the wind out of gold. And I know that because I know that as a fact, talking to some of the insiders and people who actually own both gold and cryptos. So that's, I think that's definitely played into the matters. But the, the other one is also, I think the management of gold and silver is a lot more. It's a lot more coordinated and it's much bigger in magnitude than it was back in 2011. I can only cite empirical evidence. For example, I mean, it was very clear for me as a trader looking at the silver market, the futures. I mean, this classic algo trading, it was going five minute down tick for silver for 25 minutes and then let the market off for five minutes. And then another. So they have different algo schemes that were really putting a cap on silver. And so that's very, very clear to me. And, and together with the cryptos, when it's going to stop, I don't know. Nobody really knows. Uh, nobody really knows the reason silver went from 14 to 30. And I'm pretty sure nobody's not going to know the reason why silver from today, 24, why you went to 50 in a hurry. And I think the way it goes, if it does break out 27 and a half, it'll be have a momentous event, nothing like last July, where it's just going to go. Because either the supply with being withdrawn from the market or the demand overwhelm the market, either way. So, John, as you were talking about the algos trading, in your opinion, do you know if they're kind of coordinated or do they end up playing off of each other as one drops the market, then another one hits sell triggers? Do they work more like that or are they more coordinated? Yeah, I see. Um, I see. Let's just say that the algo trading in this not that's use management because there's not a market that's being manipulated. Look at the bond market. Look at the currency market. Look at the gold. Look at the agriculture market. So, I mean, just the way they are. I would say it's kind of like you could compare that to politics in some ways. So what I mean by that is I think there's a central direction. There's maybe three or four. This is all pure speculation. There are maybe three or four concerted players in the market, and they do have a mandate that's not exactly profit-seeking. So it's definitely coordinated, and they pick the date and the time with the assistance of the algos. And also, they look at the dollar. They would do a lot more when the dollar is on the up day, and also when the rollover is around the corner. So they do also look at the macro. They're very. So my point is, Tom, they're very sophisticated. They're very coordinated. But however, the interesting point, though, is they're not exactly all together because in the end, it's the bottom line that counts, right? So sometimes uh, it's what I call the wolf pack. <laughs> if when, when things really hit the fans, either the boss A stop doing or they don't have enough physical silver to borrow or maybe the physical just overwhelm the market or they hear the rumor, some hot shot is going to go and buy a billion ounces of silver physicals. If they hear something's not going right, if there's an order for withdrawal of the troops, of the supply and for the management, then you're going to see guys are going to front run the market to cover their position. So... I think the question not so much of how coordinated they are in managing the market, but if the thing hit the fan, how is going to play out? And, and I can clearly see from last July, how it's going to play out is you get some guys that hear this story, they know it's going to be a technical retreat. They're going to start bidding indiscriminately around the clock from Hong Kong open, from London open to New York open. They're just going to cover their position. So I would say, those are my thoughts. The question is not so much how coordinated they are. They're definitely very uh, well-versed and sophisticated in algo, in, in looking at the dollar. They exert their maximum impact on the dollar update and also on economic update and, and also rollover, some of the technical features. They also have a very healthy physical inventory of which to deliver against their position. But it's really about, hey, when things going not their way, what will happen? And what will happen is like last July. Just one other point about the positioning of the, I used to follow a lot of the COT positions just for my tracking. I mean, can you imagine all the dollar, 5% volatility in silver on a daily basis, you know, on many occasions and futures trading 100, 200, 300,000 contracts a day. And yet the COT commercial short position stay like a flat line, right? With a plus minus 5% variation. So I think you got to take everything with a grain of salt. When uh, when the, when silver went over 27 and a half, you really got to sort of revaluate your position and not get too cute and get traded in your position. But right now, until otherwise, we're still in that trading band between 24 and 27. It's a long winding answer. Hopefully it's something relevant to you and your audience. Absolutely, John. So as you're a very technicals driven guy, how do you use the gold and silver ratio to kind of instruct how you see, let's say, take perspective in the market or how do you use it for perspective like that? Right. I think 
I do use gold and silver ratio, but not reli- um, not like on a religious point. Like I know if you remember Tom back in the days, there's XAU versus gold ratio. It trades in a while and invariably it'll break down. You also follow the platinum to gold ratio. You know, platinum is traded for century plus at 1.3 to 1.5 platinum to gold. And now platinum is trading a half of what gold is trading. So I think a low gold to silver ratio would be a bit more indicative of the sort of the temperature for silver is getting maybe overheated. So right now, this, the ratio is around 70. That's just tell you that there's not a whole lot of speculative interest in silver right now. Part of that is because uh, the, the February 1st uh, Reddit just knocked the wind out of a lot of the retailers and the miners raised out of the money last year, hundreds of millions of billions and a lot of these four months paper were coming out, so they're just getting hammered. So there's not a whole lot of mining interest, and that's a good sign. Um, it just overall seems to me it's very, very tepid and very, very low interest. Gold, silver ratio could be a little bit higher to, uh, as an indicator of that, even though it's trading at a neutral level. And part of the reason I think that you just over time going to have a lower gold and silver ratio going forward, just like a lower, lower platinum to gold ratio going forward because we're entering into that electronics age, because the solar, because the electronics going to cars, because we're going into this next revelation on electrification, much like McDavis, ex Glencore CEO talked about, much like Robert Freeland talked about, we could go into that a couple of minutes, but we're entering into a completely new renaissance. You know, the war is not fought for fossil fuels anymore. It's for the strategic semiconductors, it's for green energy, it's for self-sustainable, it's for environmental sustainability. It's not just a cliche, whether there's merit to that is another matter, but clearly, you know, there's going to be some winners five, 10, 20 years down the road. You just got to be very careful where you want to go. For sure, for me, I am not going to go rotate from silver to gold because the gold to silver ratio is low. I think it's just going to establish a lower low levels going forward for gold to silver. So I do track that, but I don't track that too much. But rather, I think another thing with silver is, is a bit of what I call the vagabond. It's a very, very difficult market to trade. So for months, it will trade close to gold in a fair market. And in a greed market, it will trade actually some correlation to cryptos and NASDAQ. And for sometimes when there's geopolitics, it actually trade closely to oil. So it has all these on the day-to-day, week-to-week, but inv- invariably, it will latch you onto something else. And that's why another reason you see silver window crazy, because it's almost like it's broken down of every trend. It's, it couldn't get as bearish as it is. All of a sudden, it starts going up by itself, defying all the ratios that you track. And that's why I highly recommend it's not an easy market to trade. You just got to establish your core position and then uh, loan for the ride. I, I wouldn't follow ratios too closely as a way to trade silver. So, John, as you were mentioning this shift towards green energy, is your strategy as a company of building silver and nickel reserves mainly focused around that transition? Um, Tom, (laughs) I'm the largest shareholder of the company. This is my full-time job. I want to see the company successful. So, and I'm I'm a sort of a macro guy looking at the whole picture. Our shareholders and myself and company so my point is, uh, Tom, I'm not sort of glued to one particular asset. So we always keep an eye out. And my new year resolution set on January has never come to fruition at the end of the year. It's a totally different set of new goals that came along. So we look for value, Tom. We look for value, first of all. And secondly, we have good assets that are very advanced stage. So we're not likely to go back to exploration stage assets. So going even, you know, what is the mandate of our company and what I look for personally let me go back to Robert, Fre- you know, some of the people that are smarter and richer than me. I was just watching Robert Freeland. He said something really quite illuminating, Tom, and allowed me to share. He said that if you look at the periodic table, and we only have one, we don't have two, okay? And there are some winners out there, and there's now a lot, maybe six to eight, not more than that. And then to be successful as, a, as an investor, like the bond market, if you clearly call out this disinflation or deflation back in the 80s, when you're... 30 year was giving you 15% a year, right? You could have bought and get it 15% a year, right it happening to retirement. You know, and this COVID is, oh, well, how come I didn't see the advent of Zoom, right? Oh, everywhere is gonna go telecommute, right? And then you're kicking yourself, why didn't you buy Moderna, right, with the vaccines? And also the cryptos, even though I'm not so much a big fan of cryptos, I think going forward, you see, why is a big trend in the cash in the next five to 10 years, okay? It's not like another Google getting cute or another social media. But rather, what are the metals that you need as a person? And Tom, if you look at 
the electricity consumption per person. In the United States, I was just doing that study, I think it was around 10,000 kilowatt hour per person per year. That's United States, 10,000. And you have some areas like Iceland, and that's like 30, 40,000 because they have to burn to keep themselves warm. And you have some country like China is at 3,000, but you have some other countries that are the 1,000. When you have 1,000 kilowatt hour per year, it's like, you know, you're in the Congos, right? You just, there's nothing going on. It's a good indicator. So if India is around 1,000, 1,500. So I think China took, then, you know, 10 years, it went from 1,000 to 3,000. The United States is around 8,000 to 10,000. You'll see that trend keeps going up. It goes up 10% every year. So it roughly doubles every year. And they said, well, if we need electricity, where's electricity come from, right? And we talked about fossil fuels and things of the past and coal because the green energy, but the carbon dioxide, of, believe it or not, the country, the world's going into a carbon dioxide deficit because there are too many trees. There are too many trees today versus 20, 30 years ago, a century ago. That's a different matter. But everyone to go green, fine. But if you're going to go solar, you need silver. If you're going to have solar and wind, you're going to need batteries. Battery, you need lithium. Lithium, you need nickel and cobalt. Or if you have a, a grayscale battery, you need vanadium. So everything to do with electrification, you want to get your hands on because that trend is not going to continue, not going to last. So going by that magic and, and also, you know, the, the use of fossil fuel is going to die down, which is only going to embolden the use of electricity. So you got to follow the trend. So what are, so what are they? They're, they are lithium, but there's abundance of lithium everywhere. That means hugely abundant. The bottleneck is in the processing, but there's nickel, there's copper for conductor, for silver, not only for money, for electronics, for solar. And then you have uh, nickel and cobalt. You have some palladium, platinum potentially for catalysts and for, you know, the newer generation of hydrogen fuel cells and whatnot. But that's a little longer way out, the more speculative. So you, you don't want zinc, you don't want lead, you know. So you look at periodic tables and what bets are I going to, you know, what am I going to bet on? And then the other thing is, Tom, if you look at, also, in terms of how high silver is going to go or metal is going to go, especially if you bet on things that have good fundamentals in the first place in industrial demand. And one of the things that could be adding on monetary demand is you definitely want to go to bonds that give you 1%. Why is that? Well, if you look at the number of millionaires, I was doing a quick research. Today, we have almost 50 million millionaires, five zero millionaires, 50, zero, 50 millionaires around the world. You know, back in 2010, how many were that? There was like 10 million. So in less than 10 years, we've gone fivefold in millionaires. And then if it's silver, look, it was at $50 back in 2011. Well, you know, by that logic, the silver could potentially reach 500, right? Who knows? So I think in the end, the way to go at the investment you make in the future is, well, commodity is undervalued relative to other fiat assets in bond or in equity. So that's a good place to be. And then look at within the commodity sector, what are the things we're going to bet on are the ones there are metals of the future. And that's the way, at least personally, how I invest. And it was just very, it was very illuminating to see that, you know, you should make a few bets and, and bet on the right thing and, and not treat yourselves out. Does that answer your question, Tom? Yeah. So John, in doing research for today, I heard you say that when developing feasibility studies and PEAs, they're often times quite inaccurate. Is this because there's so many unforeseen factors that can present themselves? And is this where an experienced management team can really add value to try and mitigate these unforeseen problems? Yeah, Tom, this is not issue pertaining just to junior companies. And so I wouldn't say the management experience is necessarily a indicator of how good of a feasibility study is going to come out from the company. A case, an example, say Togoya Hill, right? Robert Freeland, as you guys are probably familiar with, in, in Ivanhoe in, uh, in Mongolia, is run $6 billion over. And also in the case of, say, I don't even remember Nova Goldwood Barrick, uh, joint venture on Galore Creek. That was a gold and copper project in British Columbia. And their tailings design was found to be flawed and was billions and billions of dollars additional money that you needed. But for somebody with a very basic background can clearly see some of the issues right off the bat, even for me, looking at the configuration of the valley and the, the side dimensions of the area for the, for the dam. So I don't have an answer for that. And I would say maybe, you know, like for a better analogy, feasibility and PEA maybe are designed to, or 43101, you know, if somebody want to do a Briax or a John Patterson, a Southwestern Resources, there's really not a way to stop them from doing that. And I would say the feasibility and PEA are just another check and balance 
but having read through hundreds and our company ourselves, we've done through over a dozen, well over a dozen. As I said, I could have asked three companies do a PEA and the numbers will come out completely different. And then you have also, you know, another case of Pretium, you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether the resources are reserves and whatnot. And there's huge discussion and you have some of the most well-renowned qualified people that are in discussion of whether the resources are real. And then you have another one uh, recently bought by Osisco, can't remember the name, uh, Barkvale, for example, right? BCAC holded them seven years ago, but definitely has something because it got by Osisco. So I would say... Not necessarily. Well, obviously, the, if the management has good track record, it's a piece of comfort. But unfortunately, I would say mm, a lot of feasibilities in PEA are issued for reasons other than to advance the project. Like you need to raise money, for example, right? Or you want to you want to make sure that you keep the light bulb on. So call up their CEO and just have a very basic discussion about the PEA and just get a feel for it, more than anything else. So I, I don't necessarily think, and also cross-reference some of the people that you know in the industry, in the industry, especially if you have a big position in the company. I think those speaks more. And just last point on that, Tom, is we've dealt with a number of majors that look to join venture or interest in our assets doing due diligence. None of them really ever looked at any PEA or feasibility study. They all do their own studies. They will ask for your drill database and configure their own model. They will ask for you, they will go to the field and take representative samples and do their own metallurgical testing in their own labs. They will hire their own engineer. They will hire independent environmental firms about environments for tailings and for, and they'll hire their own social guys to uh, get engaged on measure on the social community factors and all that. So unfortunately, PEA is a good indicator, but you know, I personally don't read too much into PEAs. Even that, for example, I can also tell you that even on a feasibility study reserves, even that could be called into question. I've personally invested in a lot of, well, in a three or four underground mining operation with proven and probable reserves at a much lower gold price than it was printed on the screen. And yet they couldn't make money quarter after quarter and had to go to a bankruptcy. I can name three or four of them, right? Sand Gold is one. Colossus Mineral is another one. And uh, recently, uh, the guys in, in Colombia is another one. I can't remember the name, but Red Eagle is another one, Tom. So you just never know. Again, it's like a box of chocolate. If you have a feasibility study, is a big number. Okay, so you have three vanillas, but doesn't mean you're not going to have a mocha, right? You you really don't know. Mm -hmm. So as you were just touching on kind of M&A in the space, when that picks up, do you think this is going to be a good indicator of the sentiment heating up within the gold and silver space? Or do we really need travel to open up before we see more M&A in the space? Um, great point. So let me explain the landscape today versus the landscape maybe in the last run up to 2009, because I personally endured as a full time investor, as well as the correction that happened from 2010 to 2020. In the first go round, you have a lot of juniors out there, like probably three times as many. You have, you know, Silver Wheaton get started by consolidating a number of copper assets and silver assets. And you have Cumberland Resources came to mind. It was a gold project get bought out. Nef Sun is another one. Oh, there's quite a lot of them. You know, probably consolidated over 30 juniors was bought out. And maybe, maybe even more. I'm pretty sure it's probably more. And I was thinking copper. There's a lot of copper guys got bought out, right? Uh, by Barrick. Uh, a couple of guys in Africa got bought out. Tyler Resources got bought out. I'm just, I'm just thinking about the guys that, that actually own shares. And so I think there's absolutely no question the wave of m is going to come. And it's already, already, it's had it's already arrived, given even though it's still, I would say, the early innings of a major bull market. I mean, if you look at Guyana Gold recently got, got bought out, Cartner Gold got bought out. You have the Equinox, big consolidation that's happening. And uh, you have recently Gold X that merged with Grand Columbia, for example. So there's a lot of consolidation already happening. And then, I mean, I, I'm not a full-time investor anymore, but however, if you pull up the number of mid-tier producers that are saying between 100,000 ounces to 300,000 ounces. I'm not sure if there's more than 20. <laughs> so there's not a whole lot. And if you look at the mega mergers, well, all of them are taking place already. Gold Core with Newman, Barrick with Rangold. And so, you know, how much more mega are you going to get? Are going to get like a Ken Ross with Barrick and, uh, or Equinox? Like, I mean, there's huge mergers. I mean, to the point where First Majestic couldn't find anything after merge with that bought out with Jerry Canyon from the Sprott. So I would say the trend is going to continue and it's going to accelerate because these mining companies being focused on delivering dividend, they're very behind on their capex spending. 
And then because of a lack of quality mid-tier producers, and I think they're going to be concentrating and focusing downstream into juniors with sizable resource. And that's why I want to caution out, there are a lot of guys that have bought and fishing coming out of this correction in the last four months. It's like, oh, you know, silver elephant trading 40 cents. So it's only 20% from its prior peak, but their guys are down 70%. So I'm going to average down, right? I think now we're going to go through the chasm, not unlike 2011 or dot com in 2010, where the guys that the haves and have nots is going to separate. That the first time everybody get funded, but not the second time. Okay. If you've failed to drill resource, I mean, Toro resources is one example, and there's going to be plenty down the road as they disappoint one or two times. They're not going to get funded. So it's what Warren Buffett said. I want me to say I said this right. You rather pay a fair price for a great asset then a fantastic price for a fair asset. So what I mean by that, you don't want to be bottom fishing for things that are just not good. But for the assets that are good, and what I mean by that is minimum a million ounce, like new fund gold, it's going to go higher because there's nothing out there like it, <laughs> right? Great bear, that's another one. They're going to go high, go higher and go higher. And they're, they're going to, I mean, it's, for, it's almost foregone conclusion. They will be taken out, Tom versus or for silver, you got to have a minimum 100 million ounces because at 100 million ounce in resources or reserves, that would support a 5 million ounce per year in production. If you look at, say, First and Majestic, they're producing 30, 40 million ounces a year. They're not going to go after something that's going to max out at 2 million ounces a year. That's not going to swing their needle. So I will focus on companies and talk to the CEO and ask them the questions, right? Are you doing this full-time? Because it requires a full-time job to develop an asset of size. Secondly, uh, or somebody as, as, as smart as Colin, he can multi-thread because he has got a lot of resources. And then secondly is, what is the chance of your asset have ever gone to 3 million ounces or 100 million or 100 million silver or 3 million ounces of gold? If not, you know, I'd rather focus on the guys that has an asset that can potentially get there. So I think go to the question about the MA. I think MA is going to pick up. The premium that the majors pay is going to go up because the selection is less. But I don't think that, but they learned the lesson before or right back mining from Kinross, right? That's another major acquisition. And uh, there's a copper acquisition. At, it's not Equinox. It's another company, similar name was Bob at Barrick. But the point is they learned other mistakes in the past. I don't think they're going to make these just futile acquisitions, but, but they're not afraid to pay premium for assets because I think they're going to be trading at a premium too. So I will focus on quality assets and if during this downdraft, they're still holding up very well, that's a good sign. That's not a bad sign. And they shouldn't be penalized for that. Absolutely, John. Uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add to leave our listeners with as we wrap up here? Yeah, I mean, we talked about bonds that you want to make a few bets, really well-researched bets and let the boat ride. We also talk about the technical trend, 24 to 7, 27, 50. That is a big wall. So if that wall to come down, there's a reason for it. You don't know the reason. It's only in hindsight. They're not going to tell you. And so I would say your investor strategy will change after 27 and a half. The dollars are weaker than the last round. That's bullish for gold and silver. But unfortunately, the managing of gold and silver is a lot more active before. And you have this wild card in cryptocurrencies. Uh, there's almost five times as more millionaires today than it was 10 years ago. So $50 of silver, I think, is well within reach, especially if silver can take out 27 and a half. And it's possible to do that. Uh, quite quickly. And then I wouldn't really rely on too much of gold and silver ratio, just like you shouldn't have relied on platinum to gold ratio. You would have lost your shirts if you were to do that. And then the last point is, uh, you know, I wouldn't average down so much, but I would look at the assets and I will recommend you get on the call and talk to a, a CEO of your major positions. Just a few questions. And, um, you know, what are the prospect of this coming a multi-million ounce deposit? And what are the, some of the indicators you're going to hit to get to that point? And some of your, who, who are your financial backers and whether you have other gigs or running, other ventures you have in your, in your backdrop. And also one other thing, Tom, I would say, I've done this a lot because I hire a lot of people, very expensive people in the industry to run the, our company, is a lot of times the wrong guys are doing the job. So, I've seen this time and again, so many times already because I lose money, right? A great company, great, great asset, very advanced stage. I just see two happen in the last three months. And these assets are feasibility stage. So they kick the guy, the founder out of the company. 
who's a promoter, who doesn't know about mine commission in your mind. Maybe they have some good geologists and maybe has good promotion, a good shareholder base. So they replace the guys with the guys that can commission a mine into production. Okay. And guess what happened, Tom? The stock didn't go up. The stock went down. And so I would say that sometimes you got to be careful, understand what stage of the company you're investing in and understand the management, whether they're in the right place at the right time. It's absolutely critical to do that. And I mean, I've seen companies, I know companies, I've worked with people that I have recruited. They're running a $10 billion, $10 billion company. And now they're running a junior at 20 million. They couldn't make much out of it. So if you're an exploration story, you want to make sure that you don't want a production oriented guy, okay, to run the show. And if you need to raise $400 million, you don't want a mechanic, a, a engineer who knows about milling and mining and scheduling to do the fundraising. And same also, Tom, you don't want a guy to be managing, say, a project in Ecuador from a guy who is averse to traveling, right? So I talked to a guy and said, oh, how, how was your last night? How did you sleep last night? Oh, I had a hard time sleeping. I say, are you crazy? Like, we're staying in Sofitel in Montreal, right? And the guy is from Nevada, right? So he's not used to the diet, not used to the language, not used to the time differences, and not used to the bed he sleeps on, even though it's Sofitel in Montreal. So imagine putting that guy in Bolivia, right? And you're going to have all sorts of problems. So I would just say you got to really, so there's a lot of different things, not just beyond the feasibility study. You really want to, another thing is, a lot of the junior guys out there that have been running junior mining company for 30, 40 years, and there's a reason for that. So you could ask that question. Why is that the case? You're so good at it. It's still 34 years. Maybe just the guys have strings of bad luck, right? I mean, exploration is, is tough. It's not easy. Or he was getting to a point where metal price crashed or whatever it is, right? So it's also good to ask those questions. And I used to write a lot, hundreds of articles on Kitco and speak at all the major conferences uh, on TV with Bloomberg, CNBC. I don't have time for that anymore, but I do tweet a lot. So I encourage and recommend you guys to follow my Twitter at John Lee Silver Elephant. I got about maybe a thousand followers and, you know, just in the last few months and I tell the market like it is. And right now we just got to embrace that 24 and a half to 27 and a half. And I just hope that the breakdown for the dollar is a real one, in which case it's going to plunge below 90. And with all the craziness is happening, this round versus the last round, I don't think the crazy is not finished yet. There's no normalization yet. So you're going to see a lot more crazies. That's just going to spell more doom and gloom and better uh, days ahead for gold and silver, Tom. Excellent, John. Well, those are some good factors to keep an eye on and keep in mind as we see this market develop. John, thanks so much for your time today. Hey, my pleasure, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.